Hi everyone and welcome to my studio and um, today we have Krista Harris and if you don't know her she is an incredible artist and teacher and she will be joining us shortly. Um, she is a renowned um, artist from international and national. She um, works in Colorado where she has her own studio there and um, she will be joining us really soon here um, and we're just waiting for her to join us so I can't wait we are so excited to have her today and uh, and there she is uh, <laughs> hello Krista welcome we are so excited to have you today Thanks, Sandra. It's nice to uh, virtually see you guys and to be here and to participate in this project. I'm so excited. So I am so, everybody. so happy that you came and um, joined us in this incredible project that I'm that I'm doing. And um, I would love for you to introduce yourself to us and tell us a little bit about yourself and um and where you are and okay. yeah go yeah. ahead okay so um i'm going to take you guys outside to start with because we have uh, a rare morning without wind here in colorado in southwest colorado where i am and it's so beautiful that i'm gonna it's kind of noisy because of the uh, the red wing black. That's okay. That's okay. It looks so gorgeous there. My goodness. Yeah. So this is my, uh, this is where I work and where I play and where I live. And, um, we've got all of our apple trees and plum trees are in bloom right now. Um, and you can kind of see my studio, which is a big part of my life. <laughs> the biggest part. Wow. Of my life. Uh, did you did you make that? Did you how did you come about with that idea? Well, uh, we my husband and I moved here um, in about 1984, and we built this the original log structure we built in 1985, I think, maybe 86, um, and so. Uh, I've worked in here since 1986, and then in about 2000, and maybe of 2007, after I had begun painting uh, full time, um, I re and after I'd sort of begun making the transition from uh, realism or the work that I was doing to the work that I aspired to doing, which was larger, uh, non-objective, abstract work. I really wanted, uh, I, wa I wanted more light and I wanted a bigger wall. And so uh, we hired a friend of ours and he took the roof off and uh, I designed this space. And um, so I wish it were about four times as large it is, as it is, <laughs> but I'm really grateful to have it. But you're surrounded by nature and I'm sure, you know, everything that you have around you, it's, you know, organic and nature wise. And I'm sure you're very inspired by your whole environment. Yeah, it's a big part of my uh, inspiration and my process. And often, um, often what I think I'm going to do changes completely uh, in that short walk from the house to my studio, because whatever is going on outside, uh, you know, just switches things around the winds blowing the birds are singing it's snowing i'm shoveling whatever's going on becomes uh, uh a part of my work by the time i get into the studio so right so thank you for joining <laughs> me in my studio today it's so i i know cool. that um you started as a graphic designer and then kind of like you uh, moved i would like for you to tell us a little about about your story yeah. how you started as an you know, graphic designer, and then went into your full-time artist, and then decided yeah. to teach. Yeah, I think my path is has been pretty typical. I think a lot of artists can probably relate to this, but I always considered myself an artist. Uh, I think 
when I was in kindergarten, my mother told me I could draw and I believed her. So I just carried on with that and uh, went to art school, went to college and got a fine arts degree and, uh, uh, and then moved to Colorado right after that. But uh, about that same time, I realized that um, I had this wonderful degree, but I could not translate that into you know, how to make money, how to make, make a living and pay back my student loans. And um, fortunately, I got into graphic design through um, a series of, of, you know, just sort of accidental, happy accidents. And, um, and I, it turned out that I loved graphic design. It was a very creative outlet for me. Um, and I was very fortunate for a number of years to make a living as a graphic designer and an illustrator and art director. Uh, and then, I don't know, it was probably, well, it was that sort of classic epiphany. I was maybe 49, 50 years old, and my father just died. And um, I realized that time was of the essence, and it was short. And if I had always considered myself an artist, I had always called myself an artist, and I decided it was you know, just time to find out if I could uh, really make the cut. And uh, so I, and I had been showing some, exhibiting some in local shows and uh, in a local gallery. And so I made that transition. I sort of gave myself permission to do it. Uh, for six months and to see uh, how it would go. And, and I think the timing was good. Um, and I, I think what you had was also you had a background on how to have a successful business. And yes. I think you and I talked about this. Um, we touched on it a little bit yesterday, how there's a huge gap from all the people that are graduating from a BFA or an MFA on right. how to really uh, go into being a full-time artist, a successful business person, because no yeah. one really gives you that education. Nowadays, right. I think it's easier because of social media. So you can really, um, you know, post everything that you have and put it up there. But when I graduated, nobody told me really how to make a business out of my love of art. And so, that is something that it's still, I think, missing a little bit. And yeah. uh, I wish that, you know, more of the schools would provide more business um, advice to these kids. Right. I think, you know, I think traditionally artists get sort of a bad rap because, you know, they're considered, they're labeled as bad business people. But <laughs> you just think about all of the, just think about all of the, options and decisions and things that an artist has to make every day, split second decisions. And the fact that, uh, you know, we're self-motivated, we work alone, we work 24 seven, those are strong business skills and you can uh, tap into that and sort of learn how to use those. To, and when I say art is a business, I think um, I don't want to give that I don't want to give the wrong impression that it's I agree. Just the business. Yep. Nope. I think that it's really important just to know how to manage your, your time passion, your passion, your passion, and then convert it into a business if you want to or not. Exactly. Right. Yeah. I mean, there's an yeah. option. There's two paths here. For right. sure. Right. There are two paths here. So I think you know uh, that they definitely in school could give you some of those skills or yes. encourage some of those skills. And so, yes. Yes. Um, but at the, but, but when I started at the age of 50, you know, I had a pretty strong background. I knew how to put together a flyer, uh, you know, a, a good presentation, a good strong portfolio. And those were skills that came in handy as well as the fact that uh, I was pretty thick skinned by that point. And I, I, was less afraid of uh, rejection and failure than I was of not trying. You know, I so I when did you make the gap between, or when did you decide that you were ready, I guess, as an artist to now be a teacher? When did that happen? That didn't come about till much later. Okay. Um, I, which, was, which is really important because I was just learning myself. Um, 
you know, I was sort of I was so motivated and I was so desperate and so hungry for it um, that I spent uh, probably from 2004 to, I don't know, uh, maybe it was 12 years into it, 12 years yeah. of, of hard work. And, and even now, um, you know, I, you know, just like, just like my art, you know, I constantly question the value of it <laughs> and, you know, what do I have to say? And, uh, you know, why should I, uh, think that I know something to share with somebody else. But um, so I, I think of the teaching um, as a, as an opportunity to collaborate with other artists in particular. That's the bonus for me um, and hopefully for them as well. Um, it's expanded my uh, creative friendships and connections tremendously. And I think that's one of the biggest uh, benefits, both yes. for the artists themselves, the connections that they make, um, and the connections that I've made with them. That's really been uh, invaluable for me. So, so tell me a little bit about um, uh, the, this time that we're living in right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, <laughs> does, it, does it affect you? in any way? Are you painting anything different? Are you going into your studio the same as you did before? Yeah. I'm going to just is... turn, I'm just going to turn off the comments right now for a little okay. bit. Um, so okay. we can see if you're pointing out at some of your paintings. And yeah. um, before we finish our interview, I'll turn them on again. So please hold on to your questions. And Krista will be happy to answer anything that she, you have your way, her way, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I'm really um, glad that you asked me that because um, as we we talked about this a little bit earlier, and and I think a lot of times artists uh, sort of tend to uh, keep things to themselves. You know, I I don't like to talk too much about the ups and downs um, that happen in my life or in my studio in particular, although there are a gazillion of them in a day you know you go from your highest highs to your lowest lows and you just learn to ride that roller coaster um, but this time uh, is really different and particularly challenging um, because there's so many unknowns it's not just the unknown of where the work itself is going and whether you're going to pull a rabbit out of the hat again or if you've got the skills if you've got the energy to do it, this is a much bigger uh, issue and it's affecting everybody on every front. So there, we're really, I mean, I always said that being on unshaky ground is a good place to be, uh, but I'm not so sure. About it this, time. <laughs> this is like, I literally feel like, you know, the, like I'm- Be like careful what you place. wish for. <laughs> Yeah, like the earth is just moving under my feet right now, and I'm just sort of wobbly. And um, some days I think, okay, I've got this, because in the grand scheme of things, because I think because of where I live, and which I'm really, again, very grateful for, I'm not in the thick of things. You know, I'm, I don't know personally anybody that's been um, afflicted with coronavirus or that's died from it. Um, so I know that I'm isolated and um, I have e even begun sort of now pulling back a little from the news. I know what's going on and I You haven't been pulling out from things. this kind of interview though from myself. Not that either. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so um, it has left me um, questioning what I do and why I do it, which I think is valuable. It's painful um, because there's been, I thought, well, I'll have all this extra time. I won't be socializing. I won't be hiking, doing this, that, and the other. Um, and I thought that I would really just hunker down in my studio and, and just immerse myself and, you know, people could slide food under the door or whatever, but that hasn't quite happened. I've spent a lot of time in my studio, but I've spent a lot of time just 
gessoing over paintings or sitting and staring at things or contemplating things or reading things. Uh, and then there are periods of painting and activity. What I did find for me, which was a little bit of a surprise, is that I began uh, unintentionally a series of works that uh, really don't look like my, what people would think of as my traditional, my usual organic abstraction, uh, and some figurative works. Yeah, started. which are super exciting <laughs> to talk about. So, yeah, and so um, I'll put some of these up because, yeah. um, and I'll just, I'll step out of the picture and you can make a sweep, but they've become sort of my uh, can studio. We, before we go into that, can you just show us a little bit of the whole studio and how it looks? Yeah, yeah. Time? Yeah, so um, let's kind of back up and um, just make a panoramic uh, shot of the studio. Um, that is wonderful. There are wow. lots of supplies and not nearly enough storage room, but I have a little <laughs> loft upstairs with uh, that's sort of my library. Um, what a beautiful space, really. Krista, I mean, you, yeah. like, you're, you're blessed to have that space and, and, uh, and, and it's all yours. So what a beautiful way to just have a short walk from your house and being able to go into that environment. And like you said, even if you just gesso a painting, you're still in your um, creative yeah. space. So um, in that sense, you have been very, very blessed. And exactly. um, so let me, um, if we can, um, go into your first wall where you have almost a, like a, <clears throat> like an information wall. Um, yeah. I think so, you're talking about this wall. Yes, yes, yes. So, so do you I, talk? Think, yeah. I think every artist has a place in their studio where they um, sort of collect things that are meaningful for them or, you know, they can put things up. Um, this one, I had been doing a series of smaller works uh, about a year or so ago. I started to do some experimental works on this um, synthetic paper, which is like Yupo. It's a plastic surface. Is it, a, it's, is it's, it like a Yupo paper? Like a, it's yeah. like Yupo, but it's, okay. I think it's Duralar or something like that. It's really okay. fun just to, I, I'm, I'm a real, uh, uh, I'm really interested in experimenting and what things, what happens to things. With the different materials different and how they absorb so differently depending on yeah. the things that you're yeah, using. Yeah. Now let so, me ask you something, Krista. How um, synesthesia informs your work and, and what is synesthesia for people that don't know? Yeah, so um, synesthesia is something that, uh, so uh, the definition of, the formal definition, or informal, and, and because it's coming from me, is that it's it's a transposition of senses, of sensory experiences, um, so that you experience one sensation as a completely different sensation. And as an example, I mean, there are true synesthetes, and it's a it's a it's really a fascinating subject. And, you know, there's been a lot of research done about it more so lately. I don't think they even uh, officially recognized it as a condition until, I don't know, the last 20 years or so. Um, but um, for an example, a true synesthete might see the color green and taste apple pie at the same time. So a color or a sound or a smell, a smell would become automatically, you might uh, smell grass and see purple, or you might um, taste, um, well, here's another one. There are certain people that are true synesthetes and they have a color that's associated with every day of the week. Monday is always yellow. Friday is brown, no matter what. Yes. And some people see shapes, I think. So I think what became really interesting for me about it 
um, is that I sort of, I'm, I'm not a true synesthete, but I realized that um, I'm always trying to sort of pay, put into paint and trying to figure out how to, um, we, you know, as artists, we have, as, as painters in particular, we have limited uh, materials to try and tell the story. And if you want the viewer to feel the wind or to smell the grass or to experience a particular place in a certain way, you've got to figure out ways to, to convey that information. And how, how does it inform your work particularly? So, so when I'm walking around or when I'm walking from my house to my studio, whatever's going on, I, I can, when I hear that blackbird, I can see that mark that it's making, you know, the rhythm of that mark. And when the wind is blowing, it, depending on how hard it's blowing, that's either a mass shape, a color, or it's a little smoother. So I realized that I was um, trying to paint the wind or, or it, anybody that knows me knows that I complain about the weather more than anything. So I'm, I'm kind of trying to make my own weather visually. And that's sort of, that's how I became interested in synesthesia. I didn't just want to convey things visually. Yeah. Um, I wanted, I wanted the, I wanted the full sensation. You know, I wanted I love that because you're tapping into something that I've never really experienced myself, but I'll be more aware to do it because... I think a lot of artists, you know, if, if you, if you, I guess maybe you do it naturally and you don't even think that you're doing it, but you're actually applying it. Exactly. But um, it is a perfect example on how you're saying, you know, the wind can have this shape or form right. um, or a rhythm or, you know, certain composition that it comes at the end of the painting where you actually see it and it ties together and you linger inside that painting. Yeah, and I think anything, any tools that you can be aware of that help you tell the story, you need to know that you have those tools at your disposal. And, and I do an exercise in some of my workshops um, that's a synesthesia-based exercise. And I... Um, can you just, tell us what it is? Yeah, a lot of people that are watching this have probably done it, um, but it's... I put together a garage band, I had to learn how to do garage band. Uh, I put together a soundtrack in garage band. It's just uh, a, an overlay, it's 15 minutes long. And it's an overlay of sounds and that the, some of them are one sound and then they build and build and build and there's multiple sounds. It's just, it's just like our day, you know, it starts out kind of slow and quiet and then, then you just have this chaotic the, yeah chaotic time and then it goes into something quiet so it's a 15 minute uh, soundtrack and the idea is that for 15 minutes you tune into what you're hearing and you try to visually interpret that without uh, and I ask people to do it without relying on color particularly yeah because I uh, so you stay, you stay on the black and white? Well, uh, I, a, limited, a very limited palette. I okay, say, you know, don't paint, yeah, don't paint yellow when you feel the sun or, uh, you know, blue if you hear the ocean. You know, there's more, it's a more, I want there to be a more in-depth, complicated, uh, rich experience. So it's just 15 minutes of just not thinking and sort of, Responding. Yeah, just sort of absorbing what you're hearing and then trying to go right through your ear and out your hand and onto the page. So, but it's, it's really interesting. As many times as I've done this and I've seen people do it, I will see the same marks for the same sound over and over and over again. Really? So when you, yeah, when you get to the railroad tracks, you know, you chickity, 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 you see those things. Uh, you know, the, that's what the repetition, the repetition looks yeah. like. Yeah. yeah. So, anyway, yeah. so the beat, 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 pause, beat, 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 pause. Yeah. 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 
Yeah. It's that thing. It's, yes. you know. Steve you know. Amoney talks, our, our good friend, um, teacher, <laughs> Steve Amoney, um, he oh, talks yeah. about that beep, beep, pause, you know, and, and it's, it's getting into a rhythm of things. And, and this is another way of um, intuitively trying to get into that gut feeling listening yeah. to um, all these different sounds and provoking them a uh, gestural mark on, on your canvas. Yes, exactly. And uh, I too studied with Steve Imany. He uh, is one of the, <laughs> the pivotal moments in my life. And uh, I- or For a lot of us. <laughs> yeah, for so many. I can't imagine the number of, of, of artists that he has uplifted and fostered and encouraged. Um, maybe we could just call him up and get him to describe this synesthesia thing, because I'm sure he could say it better than I could. <laughs> You're but doing great. You're doing fantastic. <laughs> now, let me ask you something. Um, yes. Uh, which artists or uh, genres of art have inspired um, and influenced you through your work? And if we can start seeing some of your work at the same time, that would be great. <laughs> Um, well, I, I have to say, I mean, I put a little thought into this because there's a never ending these days, especially there's a never ending, um, access to art and it's really easy, um, to become overwhelmed. There's sort of that really fine line between, uh, inspiration and imitation that we are all are, are balancing at any given time. So for me, you know, I've been a student of art all my life, and uh, I realize that the art that I'm the most curious about is a huge diversity of art that doesn't look anything like mine. Um, everything from uh, Agnes Martin to Basquiat, so you have, you know, one end of the spectrum to the other, um, and uh, Amy Silman and uh, Ed Rusha and Ruth Asawa and you know I could just go on and on and on talking about people whose work is is so phenomenal interesting to me but the thing that I am drawn to is work that uh, that I'm not so interested in their process or how they did it but why they did it and what's going on in their head and their heart that uh, led them to create that so and I know you have a book somewhere from Enrique oh, oh um, yeah that you um, love and uh, I would love to tell our viewers about this book and go yeah. run and order this book <laughs> order it quick I wish I got a I wish I I wish I got a kickback on this book because I this uh, so if you don't know the artist Enrique Martinez Celaya um, I stumbled across he I stumbled across this book and his work maybe 10 years ago. I will name it. I'm just so sorry. I will name, uh, I will put this book, uh, the author um, yeah, yeah. On, on, on my upload. So everybody will, on my okay. feed, so everybody will know about it. Right. And he is a contemporary artist working out of LA. Um, you know, one of the, in my opinion, one of the top artists uh, working today. And a lot of it is his work itself, but uh, he's one of the most passionate, um, articulate, serious artists uh, out there. And this little book is just, if you can see, there's not a page that I haven't marked or do you see all my bookmarks on here? Yeah. This became, when I picked this up, I just, I was just breathless um, because he holds artists to the highest standards and he raises the bar uh, much higher than anyone else. And uh, he makes you question what you're doing, the ethics of what you're doing, why you're doing it. Um, and I think everybody uh, can relate to things that he said in there. So he's been a huge inspiration for me uh, in many ways. So there's okay. another one. So now yeah. let's move to yeah. your work because mm -hmm. I know that um, at least on your abstract work, um, mm -hmm. you know, you think of it as a work um, 
of like um you know as maps or environment um exploring the imperfect take like a quick sweep of these and then i'll pull out a, a few of my um okay so we'll start with 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 the figurative first yeah so these are i put these up just yesterday because i wanted to take a picture of when i realized i had uh you know four uh big pieces and um i, I thought the other day that um they you know, with all the social distancing, one of the things... Um, the, the, I don't know what's going on, but it's a little bit fuzzy. I don't know oh. if uh, Brenda can go in a little in okay. or... And, um, yeah, well, I wonder kind of if... Fuzzy you... <laughs> <laughs> well, let's keep going. It, it is okay. a little fuzzy, so... But we can, okay. I mean, we get the, we get the, yeah. the idea so for I... sure started doing some of these figurative things. The process was completely different than the way I normally work. Um, they appeared sort of accidentally. I hadn't set out. This was one of the first ones I did. I hadn't set out to do um, figurative work. It, they just sort of appeared. And I uh, decided this was a good time to step back and just uh, watch what was happening and kind of let them evolve. So, so these were some of the figurative pieces um, that I have going, and uh, they've become stand-ins for my real-life friends that I'm missing terribly these days. You know, it, it's so interesting, um, the positions that you have and the figures, because we are all kind of sitting in our couches right now, kind of waiting. Yes. Um, so it gives me that sensation of, you know, how long are we going to be here? You know, yeah. how um, are we... Um, are we going to be moving ourselves? Um, are we going to be, you know, just staying there? Um, what is our, our situation in this life, you know? And if you go on the one um, with the blue and, and the yellows, um, I almost feel like that one, um, she's this kind one? of... Yeah, I think that, you know, by the way she, you have her dressed, it's like, I don't care how I'm dressing. <laughs> you know, I, she I, looks I, naked and I, I, I think on her so. Dress. I think so. But, but she's kind of holding herself. And I think right now we're all holding ourselves either to our families or, you know, whatever we can hold dear and the appreciation of life that we have right now towards mm -hmm. each other. And I, I think that in, in this piece, you really um, are telling us a story of someone who is just there, but holding in a way that she's ready to go, you know? So it's very interesting what you're, what you're creating right now. It's fascinating. That brings up a really good point because, you know, um, the interaction between the viewer and the work is an important part of the process. I mean, sometimes the viewer brings their own interpretation and, and finishes the work themselves. I'm not uh, particularly interested in telling people what my intentions were, and I often don't know. I think the work knows itself. But I think we find in work that speaks to us, I think we find what, uh, what we need. And yeah, and I think the use of limited palette is very successful um, on all of them because uh, it just, you know, makes you just go to the focal point and, um, and observe around it. But it is, um, I'm, I'm loving the limited palette on, on, on these particular kinds of work. Now tell me, um, what are the materials that you use? What, what are you painting? Well, these particular pieces, um, process uh, and materials are things that I love. Um, I'm always experimenting and uh, kind of pushing the envelope. Uh, and I try never to uh, settle into one, one process too much. I start work from in different ways just to stay engaged and interested in it and keep myself off balance and uh, hoping that, you know, by starting differently, right. I'll come up with some magical uh, finish. But uh, these were a little different in that I literally had been... Um, I think maybe this one was first, and I had gessoed over an older piece, and it was late in the evening. Yeah. There must have been some elements in the work, that, you know, some underpainting in the work that was maybe still a little wet. I think, 
I think there was like some, some kind of wet areas or something that it looks like kind of, almost like a sensual manipulated texture. Yeah. yeah. And so then what happened was I was just, you know, I put the gesso on there and it did sort of bonded with some of the other uh, paint underneath it and, and other areas that had resisted. So I just sort of started scratching into it. And, yeah, and, and it uh, looks very raw and very real, and it's exactly what, you know, what we're living in right now, so. Yeah, it just felt so good to do it, just scratching. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm it sure you just went all loud at it. <laughs> yeah, I, it was really satisfying trying to scratch, scratch, scratch through that, uh, all those layers. And, but... and the one behind you now? That one? This one uh, also is a gesso piece. Um, it was much more, um, there's much more intentional in that a lot of the line work is on the surface as opposed to being scratched through. Uh, but uh, the figure in motion is uh, really of interest to me. Um, and you kind of get so, lost in between the the lines or just the yeah. movement and what I know that what you like to do is suspend the thought in favor of the feeling. Yeah, I don't want anybody to settle. I don't want it to be too obvious. Uh, I, I right. I and and that's probably why I transitioned from. Um, into non-objective work because I really uh, am much more interested in something that can't be, you can't put your finger on, that you can't quite name, that hasn't quite uh, settled, you know, I want, yeah. I'm always interested yeah. in that moment before you know something, yeah. what something But is. on that so. particular one, you it looks more like a, you know, mark making, drawing utensils. Yeah. Um, yeah. you know, just gestural movements. Um, yeah. and so your eye kind of goes from one point to, to the other and you, you know, it's, um, it's just a different technique, which I'm, I'm really enjoying myself. So yeah, we, true. yeah. So let's move so, to the one okay. um, behind it now or to whatever. Oh, okay. uh, so I'm going to, so to the antithesis of this work, I'll, I've got this big uh, work in progress that's much more uh, typical, and it's it's literally t totally in flux at the moment, uh, unsettled, which is where I like it to be um, because of the the potential. Yes. Yes. So this work is uh, quite colorful, quite uh, dynamic, and full of energy and motion. Full of energy, that is for <laughs> sure. And, and the color palette, people are responding because I see all the hearts. People are really responding oh. um, <laughs> on, on this one. Um, I think oh. the color palette is very satisfying to the eye. Um, I think that, you know, that people that know you and know uh, your non-objective art, um, you know, feel very familiar with this work. So your new work is, um, it's something very exciting for all of us to see. But yeah. I'm enjoying so much, you know, your, your non-objective art. I love yeah. that. I think this, what I, the, what I think about my non-objective work is that it, it is very much a reflection of uh, the world and the way I in, in, interact with it. And it's very much a reflection of my uh, state of energy. I'm, I'm a, a real high energy person and it kind of comes through in the work. Um, so this is the process and it, it can get, you know, it'll, it can get pretty, uh, active and crazy and go through a lot of different um, phases. Um, who knows where this will end up. I'll well, find. you know, I can hear the chirping of the, of the, <laughs> of the, the birds, birds outside and, and it almost really carries into, into that piece. So it does. Yes. You know, there's laundry on the line, which is right outside of the door and it's snapping in the wind. You know, the next thing you know, I've got these big white 
kind of snapping things or so it comes into play. I'm going to pull out one other yes, please. Uh, finished uh, piece. I'm going to go through here. Um, and I know your art is um, widely collected in private collections and um, you know, you, you have been a very um, incredible, not only, uh, you know, uh, an incredible, fictitious artist. Um, and um, it is amazing to see how well you've done in your career when you really decided to go and jump into it at 49. Yeah. Yeah, I have been extremely fortunate and and um, successful, extremely and, successful. Yeah, so, thank you. Yeah, I'm grateful for all the opportunities that I have had. And um, so, um, this piece is a finished piece that's going to um, a gallery, my gallery in Dallas, the Craighead Green Gallery. Um, and it's while well, so the thing that was kind of interesting for me about this piece was that while it has the, you know, the sort of similar in energy, yeah, it has a much more muted color palette. So it's, it's quieter. Um, but it music. looks very rich. Did you use um, <laughs> like gesso and, and mediums and everything? Yes. So yeah. is there a rhyme or a reason as to what type of materials you use when you come in, or you just kind of whatever feels right at the time? It, my my, I build my surfaces up until there I find them satisfying and interesting. Um, uh, a lot of so there's a lot of uh, discussion about a conversation that you have with the piece up close. Um, where you get to see the small marks and uh, sort of intimate, the intimate relationship you have with the painting at this distance. But um, especially in a big work, when you step back, you have a different conversation and right. a different relationship. Right. right. So and that's that, why it's always so important to go back and, and see it um, yeah. so you get a different perspective of, of um, yeah, otherwise if you stay in that little you know, yeah. five it's inches really away from easy. it. If you're working here all the time, it's yeah. really easy to get attached to one beautiful area. Right. And, um, my and it can be very method. tedious as well. <laughs> uh, it can. And we get, I often find that when I'm really tired, I'm not stepping back enough. You know, I'm just like, okay, I'm just going to keep painting. And but, I feel um, when I stay in that I'm using my head more. Yes. Yeah. And you just ha there comes a point when you spend more time away from the work uh, yes. than you spend. Yes. Like it. In yes. the beginning, it's just wild uh, and joyful and exciting. Yes. But, you know, gradually you have to step back and start making. So I'm going to start turning the comments back on. Okay, yeah. We, um, and like. so if um, so I got a couple of questions from um, people that knew that you were coming in today. So I'm going to shoot you those questions. One question was after you tone glaze the canvas before making the painting, how do you make choices as to where to put shapes and designs uh, choices using value? Does the undercoat influence the choices? Um, absolutely. And I, I think the best answer that I can give to that is that the painting uh, directs me uh, on what to do. And I spend a lot of time, not so much in the beginning. In the beginning, I'm just laying down color and mark and glazes and opaque areas. I'm just activating the canvas. I'm sort of um, intuitive, intuitively responding to what's happening. It's, it's, a, it's a real um, organic process. And I try not to get attached to anything. Um, I try not to put anything in that I'm not willing to take out. Um, one of my favorite Celia quotes, and uh, forgive me if I'm not quoting it verbatim, but uh, 
he said, uh, never be afraid to give up a good painting in hopes of getting a great painting. So I kind of keep that close at hand and I just keep going. I, uh, I love that. Yeah, it's, in, it's important. And then, it, it, but at some point I do step back and I start thinking, you know, how to compose the picture. You know, where I want the viewer to come in, where I want them to go next, where I want them to linger and to breathe and to pause and to rest and, you know, where I want them to pick up the pace. And, uh, you know, it's a little bit of hide and seek. Yes. <laughs> Exactly. Um, Here's the next so, question. Do you think of rules and principles of design as your work or is it all intuitive? Um, I thank heavens that I learned those rules so that I don't have to think about them as I'm working. Um, I uh, wish that I were uh, better at that. Um, you know, there's some artists that can compose things in a few strokes. And yes. It, it doesn't get any better than that. I have to work a little harder at it. But those principles, I think, I think are intuitive for me at this point. Um, some viewer wants to know if you pre-mix your colors in buckets when you're working on large pieces. Like, how do you go about that? Um, I have, I don't have them in here right now because I've cleaned up for this interview, but I do a lot of pre-mixing of colors, not so much specifically for a particular piece, although I, I will start out like, you know, sometimes I'll just put down several big containers and I'll mix, you know, three or four colors so that I can get into them really quickly when I start. Um, but I do have um, a lot of pre-mixed colors, and then I have colors that, um, you know, cans of colors that I've mixed up. And so are you, are you like generous when you're mixing the colors so you don't have to, you know, keep oh, mixing yeah. it so you don't, you know, so you yeah. get the, the exact value that you're looking for? So I'm sure you have like a, you know, like, so you don't have to be mixing it all the time. Correct? Absolutely. That yeah. was sort of an epiphany for me uh, when I first started because I had always painted in oil paints. Um, and then when I was transitioning to acrylic, which I'd never painted in and didn't have a clue what I was doing, uh, I just bought inexpensive paint and just had big vats of it. And that was very transformative for me. Yeah. Transformative for me. Yes. Work fast. I could get a big brush in there. I didn't have to think that I was squeezing out twenty dollars worth of oil paint that was that big. Um, so working large and fast, and uh, knowing that things were going to dry, and if I didn't yeah, you become my... more generous with your painting. That is for sure. Yeah, yeah. and being so, generous is a good way to think of it. Yes, yes. And um, tell us, Krista, like what is one or more than one piece of advice that you would offer someone who's starting their artistic journey? Um, I think the best thing that I have to say about that is that I think we're always, always so anxious and so uh, in such a hurry, uh, in such a hurry to get to the finish point, <laughs> whatever that is. And there is no finish point, but I would say to give yourself the gift of time and just to take it slowly and not, you know, just try to honor where you are at that moment. That's where you are. And that's as important as where you want to be. It's more important. And um, just to relax and just know that you're gonna get there. Just put in the work and just take your time. So I would say that that applies for today and every day. Live yeah. today, don't worry about tomorrow. For, yeah. you know, learn about the past and stay in the moment and don't worry about what's coming. And that yeah. is my mantra today and every day. I try to stay in the moment and try not to go in the future because that brings me anxiety and I don't even know what's coming. And so 
Um, yeah. It really applies to our work. Just stay in the moment as much as you can. Learn yeah. from your past and don't worry about the future. And hopefully you'll end up with a beautiful piece of artwork. Yeah. That's a good, that's a good way to phrase it because there's really, for me, no division between life and art. Right. It's all, it's all the so same. So one thing. last question. Someone is asking if you're going to be teaching uh, workshops in the future. <laughs> no, we were just talking about not planning for the future, but yes, the answer is hopefully yes. I, I have a workshop scheduled early in October in Santa Fe through um, Santa Fe Arts Getaway. Um, I think uh, there's still, it's, I think it's partly filled. Um, and then I'm teaching um, a couple of other workshops later in October and November that are filled. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm, I try to teach about three or four workshops a year. And um, this year is kind of an exception. I usually teach in Telluride at the AHA School of Art and they, you know, have postponed all of their yeah, teaching. and so, maybe maybe we'll do a online workshop. We're maybe talking about that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think that you have to kind of keep all your options open. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. Well, Krista, I can't thank you enough for coming today and and joining me in this um, journey that I myself I'm so new at it. And um, well, thank you. I mean, I I wanted to say that. I know that you, uh, when you started this project, you didn't have any idea that, you know, it was going to uh, balloon like this and you've managed it brilliantly. And, um, it, and it's been, I think, a tr I think it's a tremendous resource for a lot of people out there to have the opportunity to see people's work and how they approach it and hear them talk live about it. And so, yes. Thank you, Sandra. Well, I'm happy that you got inspired to come today and, and, and share with us all your knowledge and your beautiful artwork. And um, so thank you so, so much. And thank you everyone for joining us today. And um, I'll see you on Saturday. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, thanks again. Have a great day, everyone. Okay. Thank you.